103. Uh, Samuel Palmer Gilliard was a lawyer here in Mobile, continued practicing, uh, argued a case before the Alabama Supreme Court when he was 100 years old. Um, he was a remarkable guy. I, he was 90 when I was born. And what that meant was that he was born in 1856 and died in 1959. So his life literally spanned Southern history from the end of the Civil War uh, to the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. And he was, his mind was razor sharp uh, until about two weeks before he died. He was a man who loved to tell stories. Um, and he told me stories when I was eight, nine years old, and he was 100. Uh, he told me stories about when he was eight or nine years old, uh, and the Civil War uh, was just coming to an end, and he remembered that in a way that seemed just remarkably poignant to me and stayed with me quite literally for the rest of my life. And I thought I'd start today by reading the, uh, an early uh, little snippet of this book. What I've done in this book um, is I've, I've gone back and gathered together uh, letters written by family members during the, the time of the Civil War. Uh, I didn't have to do the hard work of tracking them down or transcribing them because other family members scattered from Alabama to South Carolina had already done that and had even published uh, some of these letters in various places. But I kind of gathered them up uh, and put them together in the second part of this book. The first part uh, is my reflection on what the letters say. Um, and I'm going to start by reading a little snippet that has to do with that. My grandfather Samuel Palmer Gilliard lived to be 103, and with his mind razor sharp until the end, he spent a lot of time reflecting on the past. To me, this was understandable, for he had a lot of past on which to reflect. He was nine, he was nine years old when the Civil War ended, and in, in 1956, when he was 100 and I was nine, he told me about the final days of it. There was one story in particular that I remember, an event he may have witnessed himself, but one that was, in any case, recorded by one of the members of his family. It was April 1865, and the Southern Army and the Southern landscape lay in ruins. In Monroe County, Alabama, where my grandfather's branch of the Gilliards lived, word quickly spread that the Yankee soldiers were on their way. Soon the clatter of hoofbeats sounded on the road, but it was not the Union Army after all, not this time. It was instead a ragtag band of Confederates heading south and running for their lives, doing their best to get away from the fighting. Where are you going running from the Yankees? shouted Susan Fry Gilliard, my great grandmother as the Confederates galloped past her house. For heaven's sake, she cried, go back and fight. I remember this story because it seemed so at odds with everything else I had learned about the war. Indeed, it was part of my Southern upbringing, as it was for so many of my generation, that the gallantry of the Confederate Army had never been tarnished by its defeat. I remember a book my father let me borrow, his personal copy of By Road with Stonewall, written by Henry Kidd Douglas, who as a young soldier, barely in his 20s, served in Stonewall Jackson's brigade. Even now, I remember being stirred by the account in the second chapter of the book of Jackson earning his famous nickname. It was bestowed upon him at the first battle of Bull Run in the dying words of General B.E.B. -E. Douglas told the story this way. The storm swept toward us. B was back with his brigade, but could not stay the onset. His horse was shot from under him as he tried to rally and hold his men. At that supreme moment, as if by inspiration, he cried out to them in a voice that the rattle of musketry could not drown. Look, there is Jackson's brigade standing behind you like a stone wall. With these words of baptism as his last, B himself fell and died, and from that day left behind him a fame that will follow that of Jackson as a shadow. This to me was the Civil War, 
the cornerstone of Southern pride, personified by a string of Southern generals whose qualities of courage were matched by their grace. The greatest of these in the stirring canons of Confederate history, a history my family so deeply revered, was General Robert E. Lee. I met him first in Bruce Catton's A Stillness in Appomattox, again a book that I borrowed from my father, and later in Shelby Foote's Civil War Trilogy, and in virtually every telling of the story, the greatness of, the greatness of Lee was beyond all dispute. In many ways, for me, it still is, and why not? Here was a man who opposed secession, did not want the Civil War to happen, knew it was certain to be bloody and hard, and was prepared, in fact, to fight for the Union if Virginia had not decided to secede. But when Virginia made its faithful choice, Lee, as an honorable native son, made his as well. He was, I later came to believe, a kind of Confederate Atticus Finch, a Southern archetype of duty and courage who came to his heroism with reluctance. So I remember, as a kid, kind of being puzzled by this, um, this view of the Civil War and the shadow it cast over even our times uh, that had been shaped by the stories and books provided to me by my father uh, who revered this history and took so much of his own identity and sense of what it mean, meant to be Southern uh, from the, uh, these figures in history who had fought so gallantly for a cause that was lost. And yet here was the story from my grandfather who had actually been there and been alive even if he was a little kid. Uh, and what he saw was just the horror of defeat. Um, and I didn't know quite how to put these pieces together and I thought about it for a while and then I didn't. Uh, for a long time uh, I didn't think much about the Civil War at all. I had other things on my mind because I grew up in the 1960s uh, went off to college at a time that uh, the civil rights movement was causing us to ask basic questions about who we were and what kind of place we wanted ours to be. And so for me, for a while, civil rights uh, replaced civil war as kind of the cornerstone of what it meant to be Southern. I think that movement made all of us ask, who are we? What do we believe in? What kind of place do we want ours to be? We say that we are all equal in the eyes of the law, and yet we don't act that way. We say we're all children of God, that's what they teach us in Sunday school, and therefore we would be brothers and sisters to each other, but we don't act that way either. And so we had to answer these kinds of questions for ourselves back in the 1960s, and I struggled with that like many people in my generation. And the great thing about that particular piece of history is that things really did get better. Not only were there changes in laws and, and uh, the laws of segregation, the opportunity to vote, uh, the creation of a uh, multiracial democracy in the South, but all of us, I think, were free from the tyranny of prejudice that kept people divided for reasons that really didn't make a whole lot of sense. And so that became, for me, the kind of thing that I thought about and wrote about, talked about, and the Civil War kind of faded into ancient history uh, in the kind of the back corners of my mind. And I think the rediscovery for me kind of happened as I uh, shed the mantle of being a newspaper reporter and doffed the hat of being a historian uh, writing about how the South had evolved and the changes that we had had to face. And I began to work my way back through time. Uh, I worked my way, first of all, I started getting very interested in the era of Reconstruction uh, because I had, again, in this uh, cache of family letters, um, I had um, uh, the, the white person's point of view for what that period of time uh, was like. Um, and um, it came in the form of a letter that my grandfather uh, had written to another family member about his own father who was captured in the last days of the Civil War uh, and sort of triggered a period of great bitterness and alienation uh, for the members of my family. This is what my grandfather wrote about uh, 
the end of the war and the reconstruction that followed. My father, Samuel Septimus Gilliard, was again captured at the fall of Fort Blakely on Mobile Bay and was among those prisoners that suffered cruelty and humiliation on Ship Island near Biloxi, Mississippi at the hands of colored troops. History shows that the emancipation at the point of the bayonet was enforced and, and followed by an unreasoning bitterness exceeding that visited upon our alien foes in modern warfare. Reconstruction and Freedmen's Bureau enforced by soldiers bayonets left a bitter taste in my mouth. I, S.P. Gilliard, saw it. This was the <clears throat> passionate uh, affirmation by a white son of the South who looked around him at the southern landscape and saw the way of life that he had grown up with and expected to live and had been taught that he might live as a boy kind of shattered and in ruins. And for him, in some ways, the emancipation of slaves and their attempt to enter the mainstream of Southern life and Southern culture and Southern politics became a measure of the white man's defeat. And this view of, of Reconstruction prevailed for quite a while. Um, but I had occasion to go back, and, and other historians have written about this at some length, and think about, I wonder what that time looked like if you were not white, if you were black, if you were African American. Because what happened was that slavery finally ended after so many years, and people who were former slaves uh, thought that this would be the time when they could become partners in the life of their native land and could participate fully in that. And the failure of Reconstruction to achieve that, the fact that it was quickly replaced by segregation and disenfranchisement, had to be one of the great historical disappointments that any people ever faced. It was personified to me by a man from Selma, uh, whose name was Benjamin Turner, and he was the first African-American congressman uh, ever to serve uh, from the state of Alabama. Benjamin Turner was a slave, and when his owner went off to fight in the Civil War, he left the St. James Hotel, which still exists in Selma on the Alabama River, left Benjamin Turner in charge of that hotel. Benjamin Turner ran it profitably uh, during the years of the war, started his own livery stable business on the side, uh, amassed a relative fortune of $10,000 of his own money that he had uh, by the time the war ended. He used that money, or much of it anyway, to build the first school for black children in Selma. And then he ran for the Selma City Council and was elected, but quit when his fellow council members wanted to pay themselves the exorbitant salary of $10 a month because he said the city of Selma just couldn't afford that and that they should serve just because of the opportunity and the civic obligation that such service afforded. So he quit that job. Uh, in 1870, he ran for the US Congress and won. And his slogan when he ran for Congress was, um, uh, how did it go? It was uh, uh, equal, um, equal opportunity to vote, uh, but uh, amnesty for all. And so what he was talking about was that the black citizens, newly freed slaves, should be free to vote like anybody else, but the people who fought for the Confederacy should not be punished for that. It was time, he thought, to bring everybody back together um, and to build a society that, uh, uh, that was essentially a society of one. Uh, I was reminded of that uh, this past March 1st, when in anticipation of the events uh, recognizing the 50th anniversary of the Edmund Pettus Bridge and the march from Selma to Montgomery, on March 1st, there was an interesting uh, demonstration in Selma. It was a march in reverse back across the bridge into Selma. It was called a Unity March, and a couple of thousand people who were black and white together from the area of Selma marched back into town to say it's time to build a community and cross these old lines of division that still haunt us 
50 years after that fateful history. And I thought about the people proclaiming one Selma uh, in, uh, in our time and thought back to how this former slave tried to do that in 1870, but the bitterness of history kind of swept him aside uh, and his point of view did not prevail at that particular time. And so working backwards through history, I came again to the Civil War. Um, and I found these letters and I began to read them and the story that they told for me in real time uh, seemed to be a little bit different uh, than the way the war was remembered, uh, the, the emphasis on the glory of it, though there was some of that in the letters as well. But what was there more than anything was a sense of anguish, a sense of passion, a sense of loss, because this was, after all, a time when 622,000 American soldiers were killed on American soil, Confederate and Union together. That was a third, again, as many men as we lost in World War II, uh, a much bigger war with much more deadly weapons, and yet the Civil War uh, became the bloodiest that America had ever fought, and to this day uh, has ever fought. Um, in the Battle of Shiloh in West Tennessee, more people died in two days than had died in all previous American wars combined. So that was the kind of reality that the country faced in those times and the kind that was reflected in these letters. I want to read two, um, two more little passages uh, and then I'll close and uh, open for questions if you have any. Um, the first is a uh, a scene leading up to the first battle of Bull Run, uh, which occurred in 1861 um, and was a decisive Southern victory early in the war, Confederate victory early in the war. And my great, great uncle, I guess he was, Franklin Gilliard, was there at that battle. Uh, and this is uh, a, a kind of picture of that moment based on his letter. The skirmishing leading up to the Battle of Bull Run began on July 18, 1861, and three days later, as the showdown loomed less than 50 miles from the nation's capital, so confident were the Union forces of victory that, it, that many members of Congress came out to watch. They brought their ladies and their picnic lunches and parked their carriages on a nearby hill, but their gaiety quickly turned to horror as the Confederates staged a bayonet charge having been urged by their leader, Stonewall Jackson, to yell like furies. It was the first time in the war that the rebel yell would ring through the fields, and the Union soldiers, still largely untrained, panicked at the sound. Franklin Gilliard was in the middle of it, with the 2nd South Carolina Regiment, where he would soon earn the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. He raced down a hill and passed the stream that was known as Bull Run, fighting not only the enemy in blue, but also his fear and finally his fatigue as the horrors of the scene unfolded all around him. You can form no idea, he wrote to his father, Thomas Gilliard, who then lived in Mobile, of the thirst created by the excitement and fatigue of battle. The indifference with which one regards the dead and wounded is another astonishing feature. After the enemy had been driven off, I began to gather the canteens of the enemy for our own famishing men who could not leave ranks. The first I got containing water was on a dead man. The side of the canteen was bathed in blood up to the very mouth. My thirst was so great that regardless of this, I turned it so the water would run out of the bloodless side, emptied it into sight of the blood of a dead man would have caused me to shudder. After our own men had been provided for, I gave water to several of the wounded enemy. They seemed very grateful and were surprised at our kindness. It was so different from what their lying generals had represented to them. The battle sounded terrible, but the destruction of life was not nearly so great as would have been supposed from the sound. The moral effect of the victory cannot well be calculated. It has thrown confusion into the ranks of the enemy and in spite of the confident and defiant resolution of their Congress, has involved the whole object of the war in doubt and distrust. I feel very hopeful that next spring will end the contest and bring a recognition of our Southern independence. It may come before that time. But of course it didn't. 
uh, Franklin Gilliard turned out to be a fine soldier, but not a very good prophet. And so uh, by the next year, 1862, uh, things had turned bad for the Confederate Army, particularly in the West. Um, and under Ulysses S. Grant, the Union Army swept south, uh, eventually gained control of the Mississippi River, cut the Confederacy in pieces, and a sense of gloom uh, began to uh, settle upon many people, and particularly my great-great-grandfather, Thomas Gilliard, who was here in Mobile in his early 70s, too old to fight, worried about his sons who were out in the fighting. Uh, he had several who were fighting on the Western Front, a grandson who had already been killed, um, and he learned that one of his sons had been wounded and another captured, and the news continued to get worse and worse. And so he wrote this letter to another member of the family. Oh, this terrible war, who can measure the troubles, the affliction it has brought upon us all? It has pleased the Almighty to inflict upon us the severe chastisement, and it is our duty to submit in Christian spirit. We cannot foresee his ultimate purpose in thus scourging our people with the direst of calamities. But even in the depth of our sorrow, we can also see a glimmering of mercy. The contest is fast approaching a crisis, and I am not sorry for it. The sooner it is brought to an issue, the better. Let his will be done. So I read these and I thought about it, and here we are on the 150th anniversary, April 9th is the 150th anniversary of Lee's surrender. And certainly uh, it was a time of bravery and a time of uh, uh, people fighting for what they believed in on both sides of the war. Uh, and so it should be remembered, I think, with respect for all of those reasons. But it was also a time of such excruciating loss. And it just seemed to me, after reading these letters and their real-time description of those times, um, that a little bit of compassion, um, a little bit of shared sadness, might also find a, an appropriate place in our memory of that piece of history. Thank you very much.